Tom Dawkins, the co-founder and CEO of Start Some Good. Milan Turban, a senior consultant in climate solutions for Pangolin Associates. And Dr. Fabio Cortesi, a lecturer, research fellow and academic for the University of Queensland, spoke to our Thrive community about clean water and sanitation, innovations in industry and infrastructure, and how life below water and on land contributes to a thriving planet for future generations. After their presentations, our guests kindly took questions from the audience. Good evening, everyone. So I start uh, the first question. It is an open question to three, three speakers. And that is, a, a, might be, I start with a controversial question. So that is something which uh, is said by the recent Nobel Prize winner, Dr. John F. Flosher. So I just quote him and he says, the popular narrative about climate change reflects a dangerous corruption of science that threatens the world's economy and the well-being of millions of people. Misguided climate science has gone into massive shock journalistic pseudoscience. So he goes on narrating and this is how it ends. There is, however, a very real problem with the providing a decent standards of living to the world's larger population and an associated energy crisis. The latter is being unnecessarily exaggerated by what, in my opinion, is incorrect climate science. So this is something which, though there are, we do have quite many GRI and there are quite many established systems which are trying to make businesses worth reporting. Now, this statement can become somewhat very controversial and it can go against quite of the systems which are in place. So i like to know your opinions and thoughts about this. Anyone can start. Uh, I'll start then. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. Um, like, I think, I think there's, there's definitely some scaremongering out there. But I also think the science is very, very strong and undeniable. Like the climate is changing and we will need to take action to address it. However, I also agree that we cannot, like we will not step back. We will not, like humans are consuming a lot of energy and they're not from today to tomorrow going to go and switch everything off and go go back and live in caves. It's just not going to happen. It's not human nature. So we, we need to find a way and we have the technologies these days um, to, to do it, to mitigate this. And I think one approach, especially going against this consuming everything all the time society that we have is to to use um to use like social enterprise systems um, where you know the whole society benefits from it and and essentially if if human if the human footprint becomes smaller that will benefit the environment as well in the long run okay thank you Anyone else want to comment on that? Tom or Milan? Well, the deferred to scientists, but look, I mean, I, you know, I agree that the, the, the science is clear, but equally, I think, you know, the danger in doomism, you know, that people get, you know, there's, we, 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 I think it's quite, you know, I think that it's quite a challenge for science communicators because we've got to kind of find, find a way to articulate that middle path whereby things are urgent. We absolutely, you know, would have been better to take action before need to take action now um but people have to believe that action you know that kind of finding the right course and overcoming the challenge is possible otherwise i think you inevitably end up with a kind of you know get mine while the going is good kind of a sentiment or, or people just pull back you know they get that they, they they kind of um pull back from from engaging with the topic from receiving news because it's too overwhelming um to kind of stare straight at so kind of helping people see the problem clearly without getting overwhelmed at, by it and seeing their role, the role that they individually can play, um, you know, which has to be a combination of, you know, primarily political pressure um, as well as some personal responsibility. But again, I think, you know, we get, people can get caught up in the personal responsibility cul-de-sac as well, which I think will never add up quite enough if we're not simultaneously changing the rules of the game. But that's why I think we need to work, work at it from, from both angles. I mean, you know, I know that we can't social enterprise our way to, to solve climate change because, you know, social enterprises have to work within the rules of the current game. So they're an important part of the solution, but absolutely need the political process as well to shift those rules. But when the rules change, then we also need the solutions ready to go. 
And, and that's where I think the amazing opportunity for, you know, inventors, founders, innovators today is, is to kind of build businesses as if the change was already here. You know, kind of ultimately, you know, be the change you want to see in the world from a business point of view, which means to design a business as if there's already a price on carbon, as if there's already, you know, as if as if the economic incentives already um, require us to do that. Do it before we're required. And then when we are required, you'll be the one with the solution that works, that's proven, that's ready to to, to go big. And there's a huge opportunity there for people, I think, um, if we can obviously get the timing right. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, and just to add um, add on that, I think what needs to happen as well much more is um, we can't allow ourselves to focus only on climate change anymore. We need to, like, that's that's been the focus and, like, not strong enough when we see the results and the uh, potential impact coming to us. But now what we have to focus on is the planetary boundaries as a whole because the 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 risk of focusing only on climate change and only wanting to develop solution or technology that uh, will potentially mitigate climate change is that we're going to create negative impacts for other planetary boundaries that sustain life on Earth. So we've seen the risk uh, that we have with water, but there are also risks for the biodiversity, the air pollution, ocean acidification. So I think integrating the planetary boundaries into um, technology evaluation will be critical in the next decade to make sure that we are mitigating climate change, but in a way that is not impacting negatively the other life-sustaining system on Earth. Thank you. So the first question is to Tom. This is specifically aimed to Tom. So given 43% of the small businesses are not profitable at present, does this mean that they are social enterprises? So there are other uh, dimensions added to that. It seems to me, the question which has asked, the only business actually making commercial returns are our elite, that is the top 50 companies which have remained our top 50 companies for decades. So this is the question to you, Tom. Um, it's not kind of whether you are a social enterprise or not has nothing to do with whether you are successfully generating profit or not. It's about how you're going about attempting to make profit. You know, what you're making, who's making it, for, you know, who's making it with you in terms of the jobs created, et cetera. So it's about having that impact model. Um, so many of them are small. I mean, one of the frustrations in some ways of the social enterprise sector at the moment is that we're not seeing enough successful enterprises scale. And I probably can't get into the weeds of that, but there's, you know, part of that is the challenges of the capital markets and the expectations of how far along you need to be and the, and the, and the risk parameters. And there's a bit of a capital desert particularly for impact investment at that earlier stage. Something we're trying to address with our new platform, lendforgood.com.au, can't resist the plug, um, to try and democratize impact investment because in some ways, you know, that is always one of the challenges leveraging business. It is a powerful tool set, but it's also a tool set that obviously kind of got us into a lot of this trouble already. Um, and, you know, it is a classic, you know, trying to use the master's tools for, you know, kind of a dilemma, but, but, but you know, again, I, I'm practical about this. You know, I, I, I don't think we're going to be able to address climate change, achieve the, the sustainable development goals by being completely purist uh, about everything. We need to meet people where they're at. We need to tell stories that they can, that resonate and that they understand. We need to kind of map out a pathway for taking concrete actions and, and, and you know, hopefully building political power to create change. We need to build solutions. You know, we need innovators and entrepreneurs. Um, but but my big belief is that the more that we equip each other, the more we're able to support each other, the more we can create infrastructure that enables communities, members to support each other, not just the financial elite, um, the, the better off we'll be, the more that will be shared. And that's one of the great kind of, that's one of the challenges within what's called impact investing at the moment is it's super dominated by the wealthy, you know, kind of well-meaning wealthy people to the, the most part, shout out to some people who are doing the right things, but you know, there's only so far that goes. And that's why I think we see this this gap that we're really trying to address. And we think the key to that is let more people kind of into, do that, you know, follow that 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 pathway of, of alignment, you know, in, in invest your, you know, buy from social enterprises, invest your funds in helping social enterprises grow. The solutions are out there, but they're trapped at too small a scale right now. So social enterprise is a world of small businesses, but that's not kind of by design. I would love to see more of them um scale because fundamentally i think there are some big challenges out there and, and certainly i don't want hegemonic mon monopolistic social enterprises either um but but we're going to need some of them to like get this 
get their solutions up to significant scale rather than staying at this kind of small business or artisanal scale if we're really going to, you know, um, achieve these these sustainable development goals in the, in the next seven years. Thanks, John. So the next question is to Milan. So uh, I have seen that you have answered uh, the question in uh, Zoom, mm. but we, we do have uh, attendees from uh, other social platforms. So for the sake of those people, now I'll take the first one. Will our species become more able to digest higher concentration of salt water in our water supply? Even a small percentage increase may dramatically increase the available volume of water for consumption. So that is the and question. It's an interesting question. Um, I mean, I'm not um, a human scientist and I don't know much about our human biology, but as far as I'm concerned, I don't think there's been a significant evolutionary adaptation for our body to digest higher concentration of salt in the water supply. Um, and so that's why we have developed technology that could potentially treat seawater so that it, um, it's available for us to, to consume it. Uh, however, that technology, desalination technology, consume a high uh, amount of energy. And so they are not adapted to every location. They, they are definitely a solution for some countries um, and some places, but they should not be seen as a technology fix uh, to our water challenges. And I think in the presentation, what and I didn't talk much about um, water um, access to freshwater uh, challenges. I just wanted to give more systemic overview of the challenges, but there is enough water for everyone on hers. We just have to make sure that we don't pollute it and we keep it uh, when it falls to the land. So things like rainwater harvesting are really important, but also we need to, to really look at water pollution from the way we manufacture goods, which is um, unfortunately not done in every country. And so the countries that are doing the most of the manufacturing of the world are paying the high cost of water pollution. And that needs to be assessed by companies um, and also regulated by government. And that doesn't require technology or human body adaptation. Thanks, Bella. So the next is to Fabio. Uh, so they have said a great thanks. Now, I am wondering, climate change and global warming is an inevitable condition. I think that we are together working to lessen its intensity, warming phase and subsequent impacts. But in any case, coral reefs would, would die from warmed water and associated species communities would be the same. What could we do to help with this situation? The million dollar yes. question. Um, make your voice heard, I guess, especially in the in the Western countries. So it is inevitable now. And, and I think we need to accept it. Like climate change is a fact and it's here. And the reefs are not going to come back for a big part. And a lot of them are going to be lost. So a lot there's a whole new branch of science emerging that essentially looks at the reef of the future at the moment. And how is that going to be um, set up? But you know, about 3 billion people around the globe are dependent on coral reefs and especially on the on the fish they provide and the protein they provide. So so it's a much bigger problem. You yourself as the person, you're not like we're not going to solve the whole world's problem in one go. So we can start doing what we can within our sphere, which is usually on the small scale. So educate the next generation, make your vo voice heard and, and tell your parliamentarians that you're not OK with a high consumed society that destroys the planet. And it is essentially people that vote in politicians in the end of the day. So we, if we get enough people on the bandwagon, we, we will change something, I think. Or at least we're trying. And the last and, and the other thing I want to say is the same as Tom said before, don't don't get like it's quite easy to get into a spiral of doom and to be very down about this. But like there's a lot of geniuses on this planet, a lot more, a lot smarter people than me, that's for sure. And we are good at coming up with solutions. So there's always hope and life is good at coming up with solutions. So yeah. Do what you can and, and rally the people around you to 